I'm here today with Jendrik and I'm starting. I'm from Soft Player. I'm going to tell you about Soft Player in three seconds after I tell you a story. A story about a game developer called Ted. Ted had an amazing idea of developing the next best Facebook game that will get all those kids around the world glued to the screen and parents worried about missing homework. He shared that idea with his fellow devs. They all got very excited. They teamed up with marketeer, with designers, with writers, all group of fabulous people. Experienced with game development, passionate, they believed in the product, and um, they were willing to spend days and evenings and weekends to bring it as fast as possible to App Store and Google Play Store. So when the day of the open beta arrived, they were all sitting at the edge of their chair and waiting for the first reviews to appear. It went even better than they expected. People on Facebook started to like it and share it to everyone that they knew and didn't know. The tweets were flying back and forth. They got a great piece on IGN. So suddenly from 126 users, they grew up to 800,000 users. And this happened. And why? Because they forgot about the little thing that there is something working in the backend and their servers can get overloaded when they do not take into account how much and how fast their, fun, their game can get popular. So the time for people to get connected to the game was taking so long that, other, that the gamers got fed up. They moved to another game, which was no longer Stead's idea. So his team got frustrated, their dreams got crushed, they went bankrupt, their family left them, they, <laughs> they moved to another project and they never believed in online social gaming again. I do exaggerate only a little bit because actually this happens quite often and that's the scary part. So how is it possible that a successful game can actually turn into such a massive failure? And I'm not sure if that is comforting or not, but this happens to small guys and big guys. 72 hours after release, EA was still not able to provide their users the enjoyment of experiencing uh, uh, the thing that they paid 60 bucks for. Call of Duty was waiting, well, I believe, over a year. They still couldn't figure out their server capacity. I decided to ask Uncle Google for more examples of those. It was scary how many I did find and scary, and scarier, and horrible, and horrible, and that. Here I got bored. <laughs> Here it was actually exciting again. They, there's a whole fan club of Error 37. <laughs> 12 years it took them to bring the game, so I guess this is what you have to have, but Blizzard was still not allowing people to kill the demons. Instead you get Error 37. And that's my favorite, not oh, that one. This I have in three sizes, and one for my dog. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, do not piss off the user. Like seriously, do not piss off the user. And for the guy in a little hat up in the back, I think you still need to get it one more time. Do not piss off the user. So soft layer, we are not a game developer studio. We don't have any blockbuster titles. We are a cloud hosting company, but we have been working with some of the most successful and most creative studios out there. And with them, we identify five of mortal sins of launching an online game. Some of those landmines are pretty easy to sidestep, but of course you get to know about them either from people like us or from your post-mortem, which is, well, post-mortem kind of speaks for itself. So sim number one, infinite focus. Treat your focus as a limited resource. If it helps, think about it as a cube. Each part of that cube is your focus that you're giving your dev team and the whole team to dedicate on the one part of the whole. If they will be thinking about software updates or network monitoring or how much workload will be sitting on your servers and how much they have to add server space, they will not be spending the time on game development and that is your core business, isn't it? So again, focus is not infinite. And if you want to keep on effectiveness and quality, let other people take care of the infrastructure that sits behind it. 
sin number two is thinking that you kind of know when and where you will be successful. Where you're developing a game and you think you went through the research, it's gonna be the best perceived by women in the age 25 to 35, probably in France and UK, because they like fashion and your game is about fashion. Well, actually, it appears that someone in Seoul made a great tweet about your game and now overnight you have 80,000 users in Korea and then someone in Japan looked at those tweets and looked at the game and now you have 3 million users in, I don't know, in the whole Asia. So what you gonna do then? Are you gonna let them wait for your game to go over whatever network you will have there to get an access to it? They will, you know, they are the one dictating where and what is popular. Do not underestimate the power of social, online, and viral when you're having online games. Those spikes, they need to be handled by infrastructure that is available all over the planet, that is spikes seamlessly without you thinking about it, that adds additional resources when they need to be added, the closest to your fans, and not where you kind of think or want your game to be successful or not. Uh, sin number three is thinking that whatever you do, your fans will still forgive you. If your game will be lagging, if your game will not be there on time, if they would have to wait 33 minutes because they are number 103, uh, I don't know, 103 in the queue to get to the game. Actually, there are not that many people like Diablo that will, f the Diablo fans that will fall in love in Arrow 37. So it, you think it's like you, and then there's the user that was supposed to be a great animation, is it working? It almost is. But actually the situation is they are your puppet master. Users are now entrenched. There are over one, I think 10,000 games on Facebook, if not more, 160,000 on App Store, probably many more on Google Play Store. If gamers don't like the experience that they are expecting, and they expect best experience, no mercy they will move on, they will spend their time and their money somewhere else. So you want to have, you want to be sure that you're giving the best experience possible. Do not save money on that because if you will save money on your infrastructure, you will lose money eventually. This is something that, well, you have to do, right? You have to say, well, we're gonna be this successful, or this successful, that successful, that or that that, well, you never really, really know, do you? And what if, hold on, my animation is working, it is working. What if your users drop off? What if you will have less users in Germany, you will have more users in France? And moving on, and so on. Well, you get the picture. The idea is that you should not underestimate and overestimate both ways. You should not be mm, forced to make those predictions how much piping infrastructure you need for your game. If you, um, if someone asks you to go for a year contract as a service provider, do say no. You don't know that and they cannot force you to do that. There should be no contract. You should be working with infrastructure provider as you would be taking a bath. If you want to have water now, you want to have water now and you want to pay for the water that you are using for that particular bath. That is what the cloud computing is all about for. It's not about the hypervisor, virtualized blah, blah, blah. It's about that you have it on demand, that you have it when you want it, that you pay for what you use, and the type of infrastructure that loves below that, that's secondary. And then finally, for all those cloud bravados out there that think that cloud is only a public cloud affair, so a multi-tenant environment, you are working only in cl with cloud computing instances, this is only one flavor of a cloud. I know it's most popular and the best branded and the bookstore has done an amazing job about it, but this is not the only flavor of the cloud. You can have public cloud and it's excellent for your web hacks when there is a lot of volatility in traffic, when you need them to be able to sc scale up and down, in and out. There is also private cloud environment. This is your dedicated environment that you can still virtualize and then you can chop it off and that's quite sophisticated and nice architecture for your application layer. And that's my personal favorite, bare metal. Dedicated servers, dedicated in full meaning of that word. They are dedicated for you, your RAM, your CPU, your network, still with all the benefits of the cloud. You still pay for what you use, 
you still have that access over the network. You still have it within a matter of hours, right? Not days, not weeks, not months as it used to be. Now you can have them, you want them, you have them. This is not for, the, for those workloads that like you would have a web, of web uh, heads with the public cloud. This is best for your databases or for whatever you want to keep and store later after the traffic or the logging, you want to make the log analysis of, of your web heads. Um, yeah, of your web heads, boom. Then bare metal is also great for development uh, and testing our environments. All of that, it would be great if it sits on one network. So do pay attention to that. You don't want to jump from window to window and have your databases with Mickey Mouse and your private cloud with Donald Duck and your public cloud with, I don't know, help me out here. <laughs> Thank you. So, and great if this also sits and is combined with, uh, on one API and, and robust and API. The more functional calls that uh, the API gives you, the better for you. Because then you can tie into you with your API. You can use those calls for whatever you need and it's already sitting there for you. You know that there is a team of developers working for you and with you to make your code as best and, and seamlessly operating with that API. And it should, so the architecture should be sitting on top of the API, not the other way around. So that hybrid architecture, that should be your base compute. Those bad boys, those are our bad boys. And they are sitting in our data centers all over the world. We are so, I, I love them, it's like a spaceship for me. I visit it every day. And those guys, those are my colleagues. They sit day and night watching the network, watching the performance of servers, and making sure that your games and your fans are getting the best experience. Now I want to show you one of the projects and invite my most favorite person ever, Yendrik, from uh, one of our customers and from Kulu, and what kind of great projects you can do on us. And he will walk you through their post-mortem how they were dealing with the five sins, how they dealt with it before, because we worked together and we, we managed to cite them before you committed them. And a couple of things that we're still uh, learning for, for all of us. Thank you. I will try to play the movie. Yeah, yes, first we see what the project is all about. Let's have a look, if it works. Our planet's resources are under siege. It's time for a change. The world needs your help. Recharge. Linkin Park is a Grammy award-winning multi-platinum alternative rock band that has sold over 50 million albums worldwide and is the biggest band on Facebook with over 55 million fans and counting. In 2005, Linkin Park founded Music for Relief, a nonprofit organization dedicated to disaster relief and environmental projects. Power the World was launched by Linkin Park and Music for Relief to build awareness about the 1.3 billion people worldwide who have no access to electricity and fund clean energy solutions. Recharge supports Power the World by bringing attention to energy poverty and introducing players to the real world clean energy solutions in the game. The world as we knew it no longer exists. Humanity has fought a series of wars over the planet's dwindling resources. Climate change and pollution have wreaked havoc on the planet. The attempt to improve humanity through genetic enhancements failed and created a new species, the hybrids, that took control over what few natural resources the planet had left. But now, humanity is fighting back.
team up with your friends and players around the world to free humanity, recharge Earth's resources to save our future. Recharge includes information on Power the World clean energy projects and an opportunity for players to sign the pledge for sustainable energy for all. Players can buy special Power the World items in-game, with proceeds benefiting Power the World clean energy tools. The message of the game is that Earth's resources are finite, and we must work together to recharge the world with clean, sustainable energy. Recharge was created in collaboration with the UN Foundation to support the UN Sustainable Energy for All effort, and to bring attention to energy poverty and clean energy solutions. now play recharge at lprecharge.com and sign the pledge for sustainable energy for all i'm an executive producer of the linkin park project um it's um i wanted to show this video because uh, to show you a little bit how big how big the project is and and why we need so many servers and so many backend technology for it um i'm i was wanting to do a little bit like a bigger post-mortem of the game but in the time given, you know, there's not that much you can say in 10 minutes about a game that we worked on for two and a half years. But I will try my best. Pardon? So I tried to follow a little bit in Michalina's, uh, what she was saying about the five deadly sins. We actually also had all of them. Um, and I will try to, to show them to you or, or tell, tell about it and uh, tell you what we did to prevent it from happening again to us. So as a small company, it's very important that um, try not to focus on too many projects or products if you don't have the resources. It's really, it's much better to do one project, focus on it and do it very well. Um, social games, you know, a social game is not something that you just add on top of the game later once the game is completely finished. It's something that you have to do while designing the game. You have to add the social features from the beginning. Otherwise you will be running after a lot of problems. Do not rely on marketing only because we had with Linkin Park, we had a lot of marketing research, we had a lot of marketing budget, but if you don't have a good game, you know, it doesn't matter how much marketing you have. It seems very obvious to say this, but it's really something that sometimes gets overlooked very, very easily. Yeah, so Kulu was founded actually to make games, social games for celebrities. So we do actually more games for celebrities. There are also more games coming up, which I can sadly not talk about. Um, but that's how we sort of connected to them. Because we actually, the company is founded to make games for celebrities. Okay, thanks. Kind of the so what else? So the positive things that, uh, that happened, you know, the the game or a game in a company, the whole company has to live the game, has to play the game. You cannot have marketing, not play the game and do the marketing for your game. It's something also very simple and, and maybe overlooked easily, but that is what's very important for us, that the whole company is playing the game, knows about the game, and then also you get the best results. Very important to have a vision and stick to the vision. If you don't have a vision, you will get nowhere. And most important thing of your focus should be retention. If people are coming back, if your players are coming back, then you can monetize on them. And if they're not coming back, you can forget about it. Um, that's where we spend a lot of our effort and work on. We have a lot of tools in our backend code that show you the retention of certain features, of certain pages, of certain uh, gameplay, and where we can see after how many days people are coming back or still coming back, or if they're not coming back. This is just uh, one of those example pictures that show the retention. Usually 30% retention over seven days, that's what you're looking for, minimum. Um, yeah, and that's, that's, we are run about on the target there. Um, yeah, a big thing of course is with soft layer and the, the, the five deadly sins in there. Server control, uh, for us it was very, very uh, strange to see how a social game is spreading. We were thinking that most of our players are coming from the US or from uh, Europe. Actually, it's not the case. We have more than 60% coming from uh, Turkey, uh, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, uh, Brazil, Mexico, Argentina. So it was very, very surprising for us and something that is very difficult to plan for. Um, 
that's again also market research. We had lots of market research, but don't rely on it, not only. Um, another very big thing for us was we, were we are a company from Germany. Um, we were not ready for problems that were happening in different time zones. There's only so many hours that you can book your programmers to be awake in the middle of the night. But then after a few weeks, they will not be there anymore. Uh, human error, we also had that. Uh, we had uh, our server code was installed on the server. Everything was nicely automated, but we made the human mistake of putting it on the system partition instead of the data partition. And then our database at launch was running full within five minutes. So things like this can always happen, but make sure that the human error that you try to avoid it by having a double team or a double person checking the, the, the work of the first person. And yeah, also very obvious, launch when you're ready. It happened to us, we didn't, we were not ready, but we did launch the game. Um, good things that happened that we did. Uh, geolocation, uh, for us that was key for server control. So we had a server uh, a farm basically in Dallas and we had one in Amsterdam and that's how we could spread the load of the, 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 <coughs> the bandwidth and the amount of players coming to our game very, very well. Um, also very nice from SoftLayer, they're actually providing very, very fast sync between server locations and that for us was really key in getting the latency and performance out of there. Uh, for us using bare metal servers for the basic uh, load on the game, so you can predict you have an X number of people coming to your game, use the bare metal servers for that, it's perfect, they're fast, they're reliable, everything. But to, to catch the peak of the players for the amount of players coming, uh, use cloud-based servers because you can add the capacity whenever you need them and you can also remove it again. Uh, and in our case, we were even automating the process. So based on estimations, we were adding more servers or removing servers. And that is very cost effective because basically within one day you can add 10 servers or remove 10 servers. That was very, very helpful. Uh, this is an actually uh, funny picture from the lounge. Uh, Lincoln Park on the left side talking about launching the game, everybody ready to play, all the press being there. I was sitting in the room behind there getting errors on the game. You know, those things happen, you have to be prepared for them. Uh, the players, uh, yeah, different players uh, want different things. Uh, we made a hardcore game, midcore game. And actually, uh, we see that uh, the, the target audience of housewives, so the 40 to 50 year old women, give us the lowest rating in the game. That's of course obvious if you make a hardcore action game, but be prepared on that. Make the game for the target audience that you want to make it for. Uh, another very big thing that uh, was influencing us is Facebook. Facebook is changing constantly. Be prepared for that, really. What is six months ago in will not be there anymore in six months time. It's very, very difficult. If you finish the game, you haven't finished the game. It's all about once it is live, then the work starts, because then you have to analyze, then you have to adjust, then you have to work on the game. It's very important and often overlooked. Uh, we had a very nice um, community helping us out, because Linkin Park has, of course, a very large uh, fan base. They also have an official uh, fan group, and those people we asked for help to beta test the game, to check the game if they liked it, if they wanted to add new features or different features, was very, very helpful. Um, because we worked so long on a project, over two years, sometimes it's good to ask advice from the outside because after two years of working on a project, you're not objective anymore in what is cool or what is not cool. Try to find professional advice that can give you a fresh new look on the game. Because that's the most important thing that I want to give everybody here. Don't be afraid to change your game because the landscape is changing, the players are changing. Facebook is changing, social games are changing. Don't be afraid to change your game if it is for the better. And beta test, beta test, beta test, beta test, very important. A small graph that I can show you um, where you see our active users and you can see some key moments where we change something in the game. Sometimes also for the worse, but the last change we did was actually very well received and we had a very large spike in users. Just something about don't be afraid to change the game. Having a vision, yeah, I already talked about that. Um, we had lots of hidden issues and costs that we were not prepared to, to deal with. 
uh, anything from using different libraries, libraries that were not uh, in, in production anymore after two years, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, don't dream too big. It's, of course, very good to dream in a nice way, have a nice vision, but don't make your project too big. Again, maybe very obvious, but in our case, we had a lot of problems with that. On top of that, working with celebrities is really a pain in the ass. Sorry to say that, but it is like that. Linkin Park itself is very nice, actually. They helped us design the game. They are actually involved in creating the characters and everything. But one story I can tell you, we, they were making a new album, and during the, the, the launch of the new album, they changed the whole color palette, the whole graphics, all the logos, and we had to change the game based on that totally. It's not fun, I can tell you. Something obvious again as well, work hard and have fun. If you're having fun while working, then basically that's the only way to get a good product out of it. Follow your vision. And for us, very important, find the right partners to help you and to focus on things that maybe you cannot or don't want to focus on. And that is, in our case, we had uh, Power the World, of course. You know, there's a very big organization supporting charity. We had even the United Nations helping us and supporting us. Linkin Park, of course. We had even Microsoft helping us out and promoting the game. And of course, soft layer. And without soft layer, this would all not have been possible for us to make the game. So and I think I'm at the end now. The time is gone. Yes. So if you guys want to check out the game, please have a look at the game. Um, you can play it online. It's still in beta. It's not released yet. But uh, already more than a million players have found the game online. So maybe you guys want to check it out as well. Thank you.